Thank you everyone for being here at our penultimate new faculty lecture of the 2021-2022 academic year. We have one more to go after this. But today we are delighted to welcome you all and to welcome Dr. Megan Whitley, a visiting assistant professor in the Department of English. Dr. Whitley received her PhD from the University of Tulsa in 2019, where she specialized in 18th century British literature. She has published work in the Journal of 18th Century Studies and in Studies in 18th Century Culture. Her research interests embrace British literature, studies in the novel and in drama, women's writing, archival research, and celebrity culture. The title of today's presentation is 18th Century Fan Fiction and Matters of Interpretation. After the talk, we'll have some time for questions, answers, and conversation. But right now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Whitley and getting ready for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate Dr. Macy, your introduction, and um, Dr. Vaughn, all the work that you um, have done to put this together and to invite me here. So um, thank you so very much. One of my uh, longstanding interests has been the controversies that surround literature and other forms of art too. Um, from, you know, banned books, why we banned books, what books were banning to video games, um, the sort of misperception that video games cause violence and, you know, the controversies that are generated there. Um, and just kind of the influence of different kinds um, of art and media, there's lots of concerns about what constitutes um, dangerous reading and um, art forms um, and why they're considered to be dangerous, right? So um, given recent media presence on banned books, legislation introduced to sort of restrict reading options for school-aged children, um, the topic is definitely um, alive and well today. And so um, that context kind of um, bridges my um, my focus today. So germane to this topic of, of dangerous reading, dangerous books, um, is the idea of interpretation. So who is it that gets to access a text um, or media? Who is it that gets to interpret it? And what are the consequences when a reader interprets um, incorrectly um, according to whatever subscribed norms um, that are being abided by? So um, coming from parents, um, coming from society expectations, religious expectations, etc. Um, so my research, though, focuses in 18th century British culture, where anxieties over interpretation practices cross um, religious, cultural, social, and literary boundaries. Um, and understanding this boundary crossing is um, a key part of my research project. Um, but my talk today centers on responses to two 18th century bestsellers um, of the day that were written by popular novelist Samuel Richardson. Um, and so they are Clarissa and Pamela. Um, and I focus on these novels and more importantly, their main characters um, and heroines because they seem to occupy um, a particularly unique place in British society due to um, first the unusually fervent um, devotion of readers to these kind of celebrity characters um, due to the role that these characters and the novels themselves took in perceived religious as well as moral influence. And then also due to the um, active stakes and interpretations that fan readers seem to claim for themselves themselves over the characters um, and how the characters were interpreted in different ways. So because um, of these impulses to extend popular characters sort of beyond the novel itself and beyond the author's original intentions, um, I'm kind of viewing these characters as celebrities in their own right, um, even though they are fictional. Um, and I'm using the term fan responses or fan fiction to denote this sort of particular form of celebrity devotion um, in response 
And fan fiction is admittedly a bit of an anachronistic term, but I think it's very helpful in describing the sort of nature of the behaviors I'm talking about and the kinds of interpretations that we um, can see as very similar to um, modern impulses. Um, so that's why I'm using them. Um, so before we go too much further, I want to offer a um, brief summary of the novels Clarissa and Pamela for any who are not familiar. Um, given that Clarissa Unabridged is a whopping 1,500 pages or so, I wouldn't blame you for not having gotten to it just yet. Um, but Pamela, um, I'll start with that one because it was published first. Um, in 1740, it's an epistolary novel, so written in letters. Um, and it features the um, eponymous heroine who is a 15 year old servant to one Mr. B, um, who is a wealthy landowner. He's a member of the gentry. Um, so definitely a big class difference between the two. Um, throughout the novel, Mr. B attempts to seduce Fam Pamela into um, in increasingly um, extravagant and manipulative and violent um, ways that include kidnapping and other um, crazy shenanigans. Um, throughout this, these trials, um, Pamela, of course, is the epitome of virtue. Um, she refuses his advances. She refuses to um, succumb to um, to his advances, but, um, and so as a result, um, and a reward for her great virtue, she is offered marriage by Mr. B at the end. So nice. Um, and she accepts, and um, we kind of get from that, the idea, if you've heard it, of a reformed rake makes the best husband, right? Um, and Clarissa, um, published in 1748, another epistolary novel, Richardson kind of um, rejects that notion. And he even kind of cautions in the introduction of that book, like, maybe don't, don't believe that rakes are bad. Um, and so in Clarissa, we follow the story of um, Clarissa Harlow, another just epitome of female virtue. Um, and she also undergoes um, pretty torturous trials um, in her own life as her virtue is tested. Um, she is proposed this kind of wretched marriage that her family is forcing her into um, becoming increasingly abusive um, as she does not want to marry a man who is not her match. Um, and then she is um, rescued slash kidnapped, depending on how you look at it, by um, Richard Loveless, who is a rake. He is charming and he is very manipulative. And so once again, he tries in increasingly um, creative and very manipulative ways to try to seduce Clarissa. Um, this novel, um, unfortunately, ends in tragedy for the heroine, but nevertheless, she remains virtuous and morally upstanding um, up to the very end, right? So um, both of these women, Pamela and Clarissa, are meant to serve as models, sort of a conduct book, what to do um, for female conduct, for morality. Um, at least those were the intentions of the author, that they would be seen as such. Um, and Richardson himself was very highly invested in making sure that his readers interpreted his works correctly. Um, so he would um, rectify misconceptions about the characters by writing extensively to readers. Um, he added instructive prefatory materials to sort of guide the correct interpretations of his works so that you would read it correctly. Um, however, throughout the 18th century, um, there were these books were subject to very intense debates over how to read the characters and how to read the novel themselves. Um, Peter Saber and Thomas Keemer have discussed the controversy of Pamela in particular as a, a media event. Um, it was so um, widespread. Um, it was so culturally significant and inspired a flurry of pro-Pamela and anti-Pamela sentiment um, and just a ton, ton of writings um, that responded 
to it, you know, pro or anti, um, including panegyrics, so praise, poetry, critiques, parodies, burlesques, piracies, sequels, comedies, operas, um, just kind of whatever you can think of, you know, someone responded to, um, to Pamela in this way. Um, so you, you can't, as you might imagine, there was no one single reading of these novels that satisfied absolutely everyone. Um, so although the novels were, des were designed to cultivate virtue and condemn vice, um, Richardson's novels, if interpreted, you know, incorrectly, were viewed by many as particularly dangerous because of their big influence. So um, Pamela's virtue, I think, yeah. Um, as part of the controversy, Pamela's virtue, you know, could be considered exemplary, but it could also, as many parodies, um, attested seem like hypocrisy and shameless social climbing, right? Because she did kind of start off as a servant and, and through marriage um, worked her way up in society. Um, so you have some very popular parodies, including Shamala by Henry Fielding and the anti-Pamela or feigned innocence detected by Eliza Haywood. Um, and so these are works that um, you know, don't really take Richardson quite so seriously. Um, so one report um, that I've quoted here in the slide sums up the controversy pretty well, stating that, quote, some look upon this young virgin, referring to Pamela, as an example for ladies to follow. Others, on the contrary, discover in it the behavior of a hypocritical, crafty girl in her courtship who understands the art of bringing a man to her lore. Um, and Clarissa's virtue, too, um, could be bottled, bottled, viewed as a model for young women, um, but also Lovelace was depicted as so charming that many readers took a little bit too keen an interest in him and supposedly learned how to do um, these terrible actions and terrible habits from this sort of master rake. Um, among those who had more positive views um, of the novels and their main character, though, we see that Clarissa and Pamela were considered to be um, truly celebrated texts that were taken um, seriously as sources of influence, um, religious influence, moral influence, cultural influence, um, well beyond uh, the normal confines of popular reading practices. Um, in one novel, for instance, um, Charlotte Palmer's novel called It Is and It Is Not a Novel from 1792, um, a young lady named Miss Digby discusses the moral influence of her favorite literature. And she says, quote, I forget what bishop it was who said the seventh volume of Clarissa Harlow would furnish as good a manual of devotions as any family need use, um, is what she comments. Um, and there were all sorts of uh, rumors floating around, um, kind of associating the novel with religion. Um, and even though the quote um, from Charlotte Palmer comes from a fictional novel, the idea um, of this association with the religion had very real life um, rumors as well. Um, so Benjamin Slockock, chaplain of St. Saviors, um, real life person, um, was rumored to be preaching Pamela from the pulpit. And so Aaron Hill writes to Samuel Richardson talking about it, um, giving him a sort of kudos um, as in the quote there. So uncommon a truth as he dared to recommend from his pulpit did an honor not only to Pamela, but to the speaker. Um, and so there's also a rumor of um, a town that would like read Pamela together and they rang the church bells when she got married. And so there's these real life sort of rumors of the celebrity of um, the story and the characters and also the specific kind of association with religious um, devotion and religious spheres. Um, so anxieties about interpretation, um, again, these questions of who is allowed to read, who is allowed to interpret Richardson's novels, and how, um, really that pervade the fan text that um, I'm reviewing here, um, reflecting what I'm calling a broader debate about unsupervised interpretive practices that cut across literary, celebrity, and religious lines during the 18th century. So um, one of the aims of this project is to show how these interpretive practices and anxieties reflect the kinds of interpretive issues at stake in religious debates um, of the time. So um, a little bit of um, sort of background 
Um, so from the Reformation on, or review perhaps, um, from the Reformation on, the relationship between the private judgment of the individual and the authority of church structures was hotly debated in British culture. Um, and it all kind of centers on these questions of authority of interpretation. Um, so in religious context, you know, who is allowed to read and interpret the Bible for themselves? Is it, you know, can anyone do it? Is it just the church? Um, things like that. So debates over private judgment throughout the 18th century centered on the need to balance the dangers of too much individual authority, um, which threatened to undermine traditional forms of government governance. And then on the other hand, too much structural authority, which threatens natural human rights to liberty. Um, so for British Protestant writers and preachers of the long 18th century, um, Roman Catholicism was pitted as one uh, represented one extreme um, that extended too much authority to the institutional church and left a little, if any, room for individual interpretation. So it was seen to kind of squash the natural liberties and reason um, of individuals prohibiting them from studying and interpreting the scriptures for themselves. That's the perception. Um, on the other hand, too much um, individual authority of interpretation could also be problematic for Anglican filial theologians because it could lead to heresy or dangerous forms of enthusiasm, which was a very sort of charged word back then, very negative connotations. Um, again, the sort of um, lack of structure, lack of, um, you know, credibility, especially in forms of worship. And it's no coincidence that we talk about enthusiasm when um, we're thinking of, you know, fandoms today. Um, but Dangerous back then, forms of enthusiasm, um, opinions that basically followed the whims of the masses instead of established tradition, or that treated as legitimate interpretations from the uneducated or the lower classes. So people who are perceived to not be adequately prepared for the task of legitimate interpretation. So for such theologians, readings and active biblical interpretation um, were not meant for everyone, but rather they were reserved exclusively for those who were adequately prepared and also socially situated for the task. Um, so anyone, you know, can read the Bible, but the people who are, you know, going to interpret it the best are the people who have been trained to do so, right? So when we look at responses to Richardson's novels and heroines um, who became celebrities in their own right, we can see similar anxieties over um, freedom of private judgment and interpretation, um, especially considering how these characters were viewed in an educational or really a religious or moral sense of lens of importance as well. So what we see is that readers who are obsessed with the stories of Clarissa and Pamela seek to involve themselves creatively in those tales uh, by reimagining their relationships with the characters or with the stories. Um, the popularity of Pamela and Clar Clarissa was so great um, that an entire subset of late 18th century literature um, features scenes of characters reading specifically these two novels. Um, and so it gets a little bit meta we're talking about readers who are also writers of fiction, who also have characters who are reading Pamela and Clarissa. Um, but these are the, the kind of impulses that I'm defining as fan fiction. So fiction that features characters who are reading um, these specific real life novels. Um, so novels that feature characters who are reading, discussing, and kind of claiming a kind of authority over Richardson's novels and heroines um, by gauging in interpretive acts that I'm arguing essentially sort of mirror religious concerns over this freedom of private judgment. Um, so there are several kinds of anxieties over interpretation that emerge when we look at these fan texts. Um, and first of all, there is a concern with too much interpretive freedom among novel readers, um, especially among younger and therefore more susceptible or naive readers. 
um, who may engage in the dangerous um, practice of reading and interpreting quote unquote incorrectly um, and therefore coming to the wrong conclusions about the novels and the characters they're reading. And then secondly, there's a concern with a kind of um, embodied interpretation or exegesis in which the reader applies a kind of sentimental epistemology to their own lives uh, where they embody or become a version of their celebrity idol in a way that claims authority over how the celebrity character should or can be interpreted in real life and by real life i mean the fictional situations of the novels in which these fan readers and embodied interpretations appear um, so um, to the first um, anxiety in response to the problem of too much freedom in reading practices of young readers, um, there are some fictions that depict um, policing impulses in scenes in which parents carefully supervise the ways in which their children read, interpret, or relate to Pamela and Clarissa. Um, so they're attempting to model different kinds of supervisory guidelines or fail safes in order to promote Promote safer or what they see as safer reading practices. So one example of this comes from the anonymously published 1772 novel called The Feelings of the Heart. Um, the story opens with an innocent country maid, Sophia, whose parents have shielded her from the vice of the world. Um, this is apparently a typical practice depicted in 18th century novels in order to keep the young woman's innocence. They just kind of keep her ignorant, right, of, of the bad things of the world. So they prohibit bad novels. She's not allowed to, re not allowed to read bad novels. Um, they prohibit other experiences that would expose her to the influence of vice, and that's how she's raised. So um, Sophia is eventually pursued by a charming man who comes along um, above her station, so kind of a similar situation to Pamela, and her parents find out and they fear for her virtue, right, deciding, and the way that they deal with that is they decide that if she reads Pamela, it will give her the best defense against the seductions of um, the suitor and offer the heroine just enough knowledge of the world to, to retain her innocence, right? So they give her um, Pamela to read with an expressly instructive purpose meant to fix her current um, predicament. Um, and she can see uh, this quote um, from Sophia here. Um, My mother took down a volume of Pamela. This said she is perhaps a dangerous instructor, but dangerous distempers require dangerous remedies. Read this, Sophia continued she, and learn from it to guard against the artful snares of men. So before she even opens the book, she is being um, prepared to apply the lesson of the novel to her own situation. Um, her parents expect her to refuse the rakish attentions of her suitor, um, as mainly because the apparent class disparity between them would make the, the match inappropriate. Um, and in the moments after Sophia reads the novel, the desired effect seems to have taken place. She recalls her, quote, late imprudence in allowing, um, his name is Lord Edmund, to address her so affectionately and also in expressing pleasure in his attentions. Um, tisk, tisk. So she notes directly at one point, you know, quote, I saw the danger to which my ignorance would have exposed me. Um, and by viewing her situation through Pamela's story, she sees herself and her behavior in a new light um, and develops what she sees as a greater defense against future impropriety. So she reinterprets her initial um, free and open behavior towards Lord Edmund as imprudent. She should not have, quote, listened to the seducer nor encouraged his advances um, compared with that of the virtuous Pamela, whose guards against seduction are never dormant. So she understands her error in accepting these advances. And like Pamela, she sees herself as a suffering, humble, virtuous victim, sort of taken advantage of by this libertine. Um, so with the guidance of her parents, Sophia uses Pamela to face the reality of her situation and to defend against the behaviors that could either, either lead to seduction or inappropriate interclass marriage, who knows which is worse, um, ensuring her physical as well as moral safety. Um, so there's another novel of the history of the Marquis de Roselle published in 1765 by Elie de Beaumont. Um, 
in which characters sort of similarly note the need to avoid the dangers of incorrect interpretation. Um, so this time there's a sort of post reading conversation um, proposed as a means of monitoring um, the young readers interpretations of Clarissa. Um, so one of the characters, um, Madame de Ferval, discusses her methods of education um, and notes the role of novel reading in her daughter's education. And so this is the quote here. Um, I sometime since put Clarissa into the hands of my eldest girl. She will improve from it, but her sisters are yet too young. You may judge from her what effects Clarissa may be expected to produce on unexperienced minds. My daughter read it in private, but always told me her sentiments. She was much pleased with Loveless and could no, by no means blame Clarissa for loving him when she contrasted him with his rival whom the tyranny of her parents had forced upon her. I was particularly pleased with the concerns she expressed for the fair fugitive when she was in the coach with no one but her admirer. So acknowledging the dangers of reading Clarissa without proper supervision, Madame de Ferval denotes great care to the supervision of her eldest daughter's reading and interpretation of Clarissa. So note that she waits until her daughter is old enough to be able to read the novel correctly. And she doesn't permit her younger daughters to read the potentially dangerous novel lest they read it with too much freedom and too little understanding and you know the wrong way. Um, and she goes even further in making sure that her daughter interprets Clarissa in the right way by soliciting her reactions after reading, a sort of post-reading discussion, um, positioning herself as ready to correct any mis misinterpretations as they arise, or to reinforce interpretation that's interpretations that she perceives as correct. Now, given the range of depictions of readings and readers of Pamela and Clarissa, um, the complex questions of interpretive authority discussed above seem to mirror those wider cultural and religious debates over private judgment and the authority um, of church government, as well as the unique preoccupation with how people should read and respond um, specifically to Pamela and Clarissa. And the examples above, we can see um, attempted models for discouraging absolutely free individual interpretive authority or more um, sort of enthusiastic readings, um, while also in a fashion that reflects a perhaps um, conservative Anglican influence, um, we're ensuring the right conditions and supervisions necessary for those appropriate reading practices, making sure that those are observed. Um, so the students discussed here assume that necessity for supervisory authorities to help young readers interpret these novels, while also providing examples of what form that guidance might take place in practice. Um, so I'm not trying to claim here that these readings are correct or incorrect uh, necessarily, but rather I'm interested in examining the ways in which these policing impulses appear um, in the cultural imagination, especially you know, across multiple kind of examples and how the texts that do take the novels rather seriously um, as opposed to parodies and things like that, um, how they depict and respond to these wider anxieties about interpretation. So um, another important anxiety about individual interpretation um, concerns the practical applications of lessons learned from the novels and this danger of reading readers um, making any application of the story to themselves, right? So applying what they're reading to their own lives. Um, so ultimately, this concern is one of exegesis or um, living exegesis, which theologian Michael J. Gorman describes as, quote, an imaginative and discerning engagement with the text from within the particular interpretive posture of the readers to continue the narrative of the text by being part of its ongoing embodiment in the world. So a kind of narrative embodiment or performance of the text. And this idea of extending the life of a character beyond the original text through performance or identifications with a character denotes a kind of interpretive control over that character as it exists in the world beyond the novel. Um, so through this sort of ongoing embodiment brought about by the fan who brings them this new kind of life. Um, so these acts denote 
claims to authority over the characters um, and also to the ways in which they are imagined or embodied beyond the intentions of the author, um, beyond the confines of the original text um, into, uh, I guess we call fictional real life, but also actual real life as well. Um, so real life 18th century writer and poet Lady Mary Wortley Montague, for instance, um, closely identified with Clarissa. Um, they had apparently some similar life circumstances. And so she writes in letters and different things about how she essentially sort of was Clarissa Harlow. So crossing these boundaries of identity. Um, so this idea of living as a Jesus um, for Michael Gorman also involves the ability of an individual or community in some sense to become the text it reads. Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with in the next example that I'm going to discuss. And narratives that um, depict fan engagement with Richardson's celebrated characters in a way that asserts the right of the fans to defy Richardson's governance over his story and characters uh, by claiming authority over them and their interpretation sort of beyond the confines of the original text. Um, so I think this is. Yeah. So in one co novel called Elizabeth, written by a uh, Mrs. Carver in 1797, um, this impulse is exemplified through a minor character named Harriet. Um, so she is the cousin of the um, heroine of the story, Elizabeth. Um, she's not necessarily the main character, um, but she thinks she is. So in the novel, Harriet claims authority over Clarissa in particular um, by applying that character to her everyday life. Um, as Michael Gorman says, being part of that ongoing embodiment in the world from the text. Um, so beyond admiring or wanting to imitate the virtue of Clarissa, which of course everyone should want to do, um, she identifies um, specifically with Richard's heroine enacting this form of mimesis that allows Clarissa to live on in a way through Harriet's sort of embodied performance of an association with her identity. Um, so this embodied interpretation plays out in Harriet's performance of behaviors um, that are recognizable as particularly unique to Clarissa. So you can see in the, the quotes in the slide, Harriet, you know, quote, fancied herself persecuted by her sisters um, when they wished to draw her from the contemplation of her own excellencies. Um, you know, in the story, Clarissa is also persecuted by her sister, so basically the same. Um, upon every little indisposition, she drew out devices to ornament her coffin. Again, this is something that Clarissa does, um, basically the same situation, sure. Um, so Harriet's relationship to the novel and to the character of Clarissa in particular transforms her behavior in everyday life. Um, and it also defines her relationships with other people. Um, for example, Clarissa's relationships with her siblings are fraught with jealousy and bullying. And Harriet too considers herself a victim when her sisters do not conform um, to her wishes about how they should behave or how they should let um, Harriet behave. Um, so Harriet, imitates Clarissa's actions, um, behaving charitably towards chickens by feeding them as Clarissa did, um, but prefer preparing for her end when circumstances seem bleak. Um, and so while Harriet's behavior does come across as ridiculous in the novel, um, the extent to which she identifies with Richardson's character and applies the text to her everyday life, letting it form inform all of her motivations, her conduct, her sentiments, um, this illustrates a really sort of unique moment, um, I'm arguing, of fandom activity. Um, so even though her behavior is perceived as ridiculous, it is allowed to persist without definitive intervention, which I think is interesting. Now, Harriet's relationship to Clarissa and Pamela is directly the result of her very dedicated form of reading the novels. Um, so this is an obsession that permeates every aspect of her life and also helps her know how she should act towards, feel about, or interact with the world around her. Um, informed by the novels she reads and the characters she looks up to, Harriet enacts a kind of um, sentimental epistemology that defines 
her worldview. Um, so her reading of sentimental novels is the single most important facet of her character in the novel, and it determines um, every aspect of how she navigates the world around her. Um, so the narrator reveals that Harriet had a read a great deal and this dedication to reading specifically novels informs all of her actions and interactions. Um, as she learns languages and music, her efforts are processed through the lens of sentimentality. She can speak but quote a little of the French language and play a few tunes on an old spinet, but more importantly than her proficiency in these areas is the fact that she does so with a peculiar grace, right, specifically an imitation of her favorite heroines. So to prepare for social, social situations, she studies the most languishing attitudes and rehearses her plaintive voice. And her constant dedication to sentimental performance is a prominent feature of her characterization in the novel and just consistently informs her behavior. Um, when she, for instance, encounters um, a suitor, the charming Lord Landover, who's actually in love with the, the main heroine, Elizabeth, but you know, she doesn't quite realize that or acknowledge that. Um, so she prepares for this visit um, by studying the most engaging attitudes that she might know how best to address him, whether with a sentimental grave cast or with a wild gaiety peculiar to the sympathy, uh, simplicity of youth and innocence. So her study of sentimental attitudes um, is rooted in her extensive reading, demonstrating the immense time and energy she expends studying and poring over these novels. Um, she's not particularly adept at the activities belonging to a more traditional education, but she is quite the expert when it comes to reading and recalling novels. Um, when the suitor Lord Landover arrives, for instance, she demonstrates her vast knowledge and sentimental expertise by quote, quote, quoting passages from different authors she had read for which having a good memory, she was never at a loss. So her extensive study and memorization of the literature she's read marks a kind of special knowledge of novels, the result of really dedicated and passionate study. Um, her intense and energetic devotion to her fandom informs her sense of self um, and others and displays both an unusual level of connection to admired sentimental figures, as well as a remarkable dedication to sentimental ways of being and of knowing. Now, it's important to acknowledge that um, though the extent to which Harriet enacts her sentimental epistemology, um, uses it to embody her favorite celebrity characters is remarkable. Um, her claims to authority over Richardson's characters um, do not exactly go unchallenged um, in the narrative. So within the story, Harriet's literary expertise is shown to be skilled, but it is also criticized for its lack of judgment and um, originality of thought. Um, it's largely considered, her behavior is largely considered um, in a negative light by the narrator who comments that Harriet has, quote, stuffed her head without the least improving her judgment, or that indeed of the latter, meaning judgment, she possessed but a small portion. Um, and we also learn that her, the family, her uncle not accepted, looked up to Harriet as possessing superior knowledge, though Elizabeth herself had formed but a mean opinion of her understanding. Um, and also that her reading, her extensive reading, neither improved her judgment, her understanding, or her taste. Right, so this is the, the narrator's opinion. Um, the scene's emphasis on distinguishing between Harriet's knowledge, um, acknowledged again as a remar remarkable, and her lack of understanding and judgment um, speaks to those kinds of concerns, again, over individual judgment and interpretation um, that carry over from that religious sphere. So we're no longer dealing necessarily with matters of safety, as in some of the novels discussed earlier, um, but here the issues do denote a lack of taste, um, a discussion of which serves to, um, at least in the novel, invalidate Harriet's opinions and interpretations. So in directing her own reading and claiming her own authority to interpret, um, Harriet's not necessarily acting um, appropriately um, or towards uh, correct interpretations of the text, at least according to the narrator. Um, unlike the young readers discussed earlier, she's not been adequately prepared by parental guidance to improve her judgment and understanding. Um, and so part of the criticism of Harriet's interpretive practices comes from the disparity between her circumstances and those of Pamela or Clarissa, right? Her suffering um, 
is selfishly and vainly motivated rather than motivated by the um, sort of actual, you know, hardship of Pamela and Clarissa's conditions. Um, and so her sense of main mental behaviors in the novel towards others come across as affected or insincere. Um, for instance, when she first meets her cousin Elizabeth, um, she expresses an undying friendship that, quote, no human power could divide, um, because that's what sentimental heroine friendships are supposed to, to look like, and that's what you're supposed to say, um, based on one meeting is when she says this. So, um, but Harriet's relationship to an identification with Clarissa and Pamela um, offer her a kind of authority over those characters that allows her to make sense of herself and of the world around her. Um, so from reading those novels, she's able to understand how to act towards her new friend, how to act towards suitors, um, and also how to interact with her family. Um, she knows how to tailor her sentimental knowledge to the situation at hand and act um, what she would consider, you know, appropriately given the situation. So her claims to authority of interpretation through this sort of living exegesis um, of Pamela and especially Clarissa demonstrate um, a distinct way of perceiving oneself and others to devotion Aspects, acts of interpretation, um, fostering this sort of unique sense of intimacy with Richardson's characters and illustrating these sort of dedicated impulses of fandom. So um, kind of concluding here, um, we have this um, quote from Ann Jameson. She writes that fan fiction, kind of going back to that term, asserts the rights of storytellers to take possession of characters and settings um, from other people's. So in other words, affirming the right of, fan, right of fan writers to undermine the intentions of the original author. Um, so the impulse to claim authority of interpretation over Pamela and Clarissa um, was widespread in British culture um, and at times encouraged or denounced by Richardson himself. Um, fan acts of interpretation such as the one today um, disengage with the issues of private judgment and authority over interpretation that were central to many religious debates of the 18th century as well. Um, they similarly engage with the wider cultural and religious questions of who has access to a text, how access to a text should be supervised or not, um, the role of pro private judgment, and also the nature of fan interpretations. Um, so while none of these texts discussed today offers an easy answer to questions of correct reading, um, the act of claiming ownership over the characters allows those individual fan readers to establish unique relationships with the characters in ways that inflect their sense of identity in the world and also complicate our view of the influence of interpretive reading practices and the anxieties that surround them. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, Dr. Withy. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I imagine members of our audience may have some questions or comments they would like to share. So I'd like to open up the floor to anyone, both the audible floor and also the chat. If you would like to pose a question or make a comment, please do. Oh, Dr. Putnam. I'll, I'll, I'll start. I was noticing, I, um, Megan, that uh, the dates of these publications, you know, where you've got Clarissa and Pamela in the 1740s, and then these subsequent publications being, you know, between 32 and almost 60 years afterwards. Hmm. So, you know, these books become sort of legends, you know, in terms of when they were published, and then the that contemporary group reading them, and then you've got a next generation or a next mm. generation. And I'm just wondering mm. if you could comment on that at all in terms of even the timing of these kinds of fan fictions that are coming mm. later when they are reading or rereading um, the original texts. Yeah, I think it um, just kind of speaks to how popular and how pervasive these stories were and how many people were just so emotionally invested in sort of creating and recreating the stories themselves. Um, there was one author who didn't like that Clarissa had a tragic ending and so she changed it to a happy ending. She wrote it herself. Um, and 
I don't know, there's just something about it that people could get not get enough of. And um, I think probably you have more of the serious parodies that come out um, a little bit sooner, um, you know, Fielding and Richardson being contemporaries. Um, but in my studies, I found mm -hmm. not just, you know, people who want to make fun of Clarissa and Pamela, because they do get a little bit much <laughs> at times, um, but people who kind of are engaging in these sort of more serious, um, sort of affectionate, like, oh, I identify with that. So I there's something about it that um, just persists in, um, in what people are identifying with and how they want to identify and how they want to indulge and how, um, I guess, realistic they are um, as sentimental novels, you know, remain popular through the end of the century. I think Ainsley Clifton is the next person with a hand up. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to say I really, really enjoyed your presentation. I, I write you. fan fiction myself mm. on occasion, mm. so I thought it was very interesting. And it also kind of reminds me of, I've read an epistolary novel before, and it's The Coquette. And I believe mm -hmm. it does reference um, Pamela and uh, what was the other one? Clarissa as well. And I just thought that was interesting that you, that it, it kind of itself in its own way was kind of a fan fiction in its own self, kind of from taking from that, I think. Yeah. And I just thought that was very interesting too. And also just to see how fan fiction has been relevant since like that long ago. And I, Dr. Johnson's in here too, and I'm in her class. She's teaching a rhetoric of zines class and um, we get to explore fan fiction and all this type of stuff. So I just thought this was super interesting. But thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, one of the um, things that my project sort of more largely aims to do is, is like mm. you said, to kind of show how long these fan fiction, fan fiction impulses have existed. And I'm tracing it to the beginning of um, a sort of like commercial boom of publication in the 18th century. Um, but I mean, in the, in the widest sense, um, you know, people have been modifying other texts for a very long time. So I'm excited that you're studying this. Great, um, David Smith. Hi, Megan. Uh, I thought this was a really fascinating talk and I'd love to chat more about it um, some other time perhaps, but uh, I couldn't help but think of Austin's first novel, Northanger Abbey, mm -hmm. which is a very, not only a, a direct parody and also a kind of a fan fiction for Gothic novels, but also I was struck by the similarities where Catherine, the main character, is enacting these actual, um, these, these, these traditions and tropes from a Gothic text. And in doing so is actually kind of creating problems within her relationship with this guy that she kind of has the hots for and her perception of the father who might be a bad guy, but isn't this mustache twirling Gothic villain there, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if A, you sort of had thought about that or looked into the connection with the Gothic, which is sort of the other major 18th century novel that's on the rise there. Because again, Austin is overly referencing Monk Lewis and Walpole and Radcliffe in there. So it's a very clear, uh, it's, it's almost like is Austin parodying this sort of parody fan fiction thing? Is she in, in fact mm. doing a meta meta mm. commentary there? But also I was wondering if, because uh, you mentioned the, the connection between sentimentalism and this notion of sort of almost like overly emotionally identifying with the text. Is there, is it, is it unique? Is there something about mm. the sentimental text <clears throat> volume of the novel that's unique to it? Or is it something that's more in, em, emblematic, if you will, of um, Gothic novels, sentimental novels, because they're kind of playing on or dealing with emotionality? Um, I will try to answer your question. <laughs> um, I've not dealt in this particular project a lot with Gothic, but it definitely relates to um, the sentimentality. Um, as you said, Gothic, 
I kind of see as having a little bit more specific tropes associated with that, which, as you said, Austin is clearly parodying in Northanger Abbey, and that's one of my mm. uh, favorite novels. Um, and it strikes me that, you know, Catherine and, um, and Henry and kind of the rest of the characters are existing basically in two different novels, um, kind of like the um, Harriet in the Elizabeth novel I, I mentioned in my talk. Um, you know, she is existing in a Gothic novel, right? That is sort of her, her epistemology, like it kind of informs how neat she needs to act, how she needs to view her um you know the um the father and and the house even though none of it is scary none of it is like actually gothic um and she kind of laments those things that um that don't fit within the gothic tropes by tiring attention to it um but she is existing kind of in a different story than everyone else who's in a very sort of normal pattern <laughs> i guess um and I can't remember what your other questions were. I'm so sorry. That's uh, fine. Uh, it's just great, a great presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm not sure how meta Austin was trying to be. I mean, certainly she was parroting, but uh, we could probably take it further. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I'm curious as to whether you might also, you know, talk about what is the relationship between this kind of living exegesis? I thought that was a great way of thinking about this. Um, you know, which we're seeing in Northanger Abbey and 18th century discourses about so quixotism, thinking about something like Lennox's female quixot, um, you know, where there's this, again, this kind of enactment, which is both commentary and reflection on appropriation of and revision of the text, a kind of, a kind of living fan fiction. Yeah, I think that's a really um, good example to, to bring up. And it's kind of similar to, to Harriet, again, of, you know, how this character who is living a sentimental novel, she is a sentimental heroine, um, embodying this, again, kind of epistemology of informing, this is how I need to behave, this is how I need to act, this is how I need to feel, this is how I need to show those feelings um, in a world that, you know, doesn't accept that epistemology um, as well. Um, and it becomes a real sort of danger, right? Because she's not allowed to continue that way at the end of the female quickset. And, you know, it's it's not acceptable. Um, she's interpreting it the wrong way. She's too enthusiastic. She's gone sort of overboard. Um, even though, I mean, as a reader myself, it's like I want her to, to take that authority of her, <laughs> her own life and continue on as she is um, in this sort of subversive way. Um, but it does act against, you know, that those norms. Thank and I you. think like in a religious sense too, you know, you can think about like, you know, if you're applying principles to yourself in a, a selfish or sort of wrong way, that's also kind of considered dangerous in religious context as well. So definitely a sort of parallel there. Great, thank you. Other comments, questions, reflections? I might have a super specialist question. I don't know. Um, do you think that there is something about the relative, you know, sort of the gender, the socioeconomic placement of the protagonist that affects the degree to which this sort of fan fiction identification living exegesis takes place? I'm thinking about the, the differences between the popular response to Pamela and Clarissa, and also about Sir Charles Grandison, Richardson's third novel, which I think maybe does not attract the same kind of engagement where we're shifted to maybe a male protagonist, hard to say the protagonist is, I would argue, um, who in, in a kind of high level of aristocracy. What is it that, you know, particularly about the way characters are, are conceived, framed, situated? that either does or does not seem to invite or authorize this degree of fan fiction, cosplay, living exegesis. Yeah, um, yeah, your question um, is a very good one. And it, so basically th the danger is, um, especially for young women readers yeah. who are, um, 
you know, of course, you know, super susceptible to to all the wrong things of sentimentality. Um, so in Pamela, I mean, one of the main issues that people had was specifically her social climbing. Um, it was not acceptable for a servant, you know, of the lower class to, you know, wheedle her way up to um, be the wife of a, a, you know, in the gentry class. Um, so that was a huge, huge um, sort of dangerous influence of that particular novel you know you can admire Pamela for her virtuous behavior but we draw the line at <laughs> at social mobility mm -hmm. um, and then especially for women who um, of course you know need to be educated and influenced and you know they can't know too much about the world because we have to preserve their innocence um, and if they're claiming their own authority over interpretation instead of learning it from say their parents you know that is very dangerous that's very social Socially disruptive as well. Um, so definitely, you know, class gender are um, absolutely at play here. There's another novel I didn't mention today too, but um, it features um, these two characters. One is upper class, one is lower class, this sort of female friendship. And the lower class girl gets in trouble with her father because not only is she engaging in this sort of sentimental, you know, letters, that epistolary discourse, um, but it's making her have notions above her station. Right. Mm -hmm. So the upper class woman who's also engaging in this correspondence is not criticized, except that maybe you should stop because it's putting my daughter in, in peril. She's not going to you know, marry the right guy, you know, that she can have. She's going to have, you know, illusions of grandeur and it's going to mess her up socially. Um, and so that is the danger. Right. Not so much that the upper class character is engaging in these behaviors, but that the lower class character is as well. So absolutely. Thank you. What else? Any final comments or reflections? Well, again, thank you so much. Thank you Dr. all Whitney so much for, for a coming. great talk and a great conversation. It's been a pleasure. It. Bravo. We have one more of these visiting faculty, new faculty lectures, not a visiting faculty member, but in two weeks from today at this time in this Zoom venue, Elena Mizell, a lecturer of Criminal Justice will be speaking with us, so we hope to see you then. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks so much.